Well, hello, church. Are you all here today? Hello, church. I tell you what, man, we got to we got to get our uh, we got to get our, our our excitement about us. After all, the tigers are doing good. The lions are well, you know. I mean, our our, our teams are doing well. The Jesus team is doing well, huh? It's good to see you in church today. It's great to have you in fellowship as we come and and celebrate the Lord. Uh, I just want to give you a couple announcements as we begin today. The first one is the Connect cards are right there in front of you, in the the pew in front of you. And if you would fill one of those out, um, if you're new today, let us know who you are. Uh, It would be great to know that. And also, if you've got a prayer request or anything that we need to be aware of, please uh, fill that information out and, uh, and let us know. We've got a couple things going on. Uh, right after church today is going to be the Christmas choir. You got anything to say about that, Reeve? If you are interested in being in the choir, but you don't want to have the long, long commitment of all the time, you know, every Sunday, this is a great way for you to kind of get your feet wet or get to be able to be involved. So we start today at noon. So we'll be happy to have you if you are interested. So the invitation is still open to come and join us? Yep. All righty. Okay. No reading music required. Okay. All righty. Good. Good. So if you want to be a last minute recruit, you can be. Uh, all you have to do is to stick around right afterwards and you will be like me. I am in the, the special choirs. I'm not in the regular choir. They won't allow that. But uh, anyway, um, if you'd like to be in the, uh, the special choir, the Christmas choir, it's happening right after church today. Uh, We've got uh, the nominations for the leadership core starting and uh, the information is is here in your in your bulletin and the sheets for that are right out there on the uh, the welcome desk. You got any word for us about youth? Good morning, everybody. Uh, First annual uh, Amped Teen Ministry tailgate party is going to be a week from today. That's the 13th, uh, at, starting at 3.30 p.m., and we're going to go till whenever, whenever anybody leaves. Um, just going to hang out, have some food. Uh, that's all going to be supplied, hot dogs, hamburgers, stuff like that, chips. Um, that's for grades 6 through 12, and it's going to be down on the other end of the church uh, in the parking lot right by the gymnasium. So in case there's any weather, we can just transition right into the gym. So this is a multi-church thing, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Living Water Wesleyan. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that or not, but it's over in Russellville on Coldwater Road. Uh, Tony Oglin, a good friend of mine and the owner of Davison Overhead Door, you guys might know that, um, is the youth leader there. He's been there for quite some time. So we're going to co-op and just give the teens an opportunity to hang out with each other and socialize and have a good time. Good. Good. That's excellent to see. And uh, it multiplies our youth, right? Uh, Bringing these youth groups together, it's great for them to know there's others uh, out there. So this is great. Uh, Thank you, Ryan. Hey, uh, the fall festival is coming. I give you advance notice on that because there's a little bit of a ramp up required for that fall festival. It is happening October 31st from 6 to 8 in in our gym. And uh, you can help by providing things. The information is in here. If you'll just make sure to be aware of that. And uh, certainly volunteer if you're willing to do that. Uh, it is a great opportunity to meet our community and to, uh, and to do an alternative thing uh, for uh, instead of the regular Halloween stuff. So it'll be the Fall Festival, October 31st. Make yourself aware of that. Volunteer if you would. All righty. And with that, let's begin worship. Bright shining faces here today. Are you ready to do some singing? Well, the choir is. Thank you, choir. I'm glad you're ready to sing. Okay, everybody else, are you ready to sing too? Woo! All right. (laughs) Well, let's stand and sing together.
There to my heart was his blood applied. It is the theme today for communion. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you ourselves today. We give you our praise today. We give you our minds today. And Lord, we are here to learn. We are here to hear from you. We are here, Lord, to be obedient to your word as well. We desire to be pleasing to you and to sing your praises and to honor you as our God. It is a pleasure to be here, Lord. Thank you for this life. Thank you for this, this, this place we can gather today. Thank you for the brothers and sisters who meet here and, uh, and come with the same thought in mind to bring you praise, to give you ourselves, and to, uh, and to just celebrate who you are. We thank you, Lord, for communion. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have provided. And, uh, and, and Jesus, you have done amazingly well. You have, you have blessed us more than we ever thought. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
before we come and dine, before the ushers come and serve communion to us, I want you to make sure that you have prepared yourself. As the scripture says, we are to prepare ourselves to to consider um, where we are. If there's anything that needs to be taken care of before we come to the table, because we are to prepare ourselves to receive what the Lord has done for us, given to us. To not come unworthily, but instead to prepare ourselves and make sure that we are right with him before we take the Lord's Supper with him. So as the the servers come, remember again, prepare yourself before you come and dine. Our theme today is communion. The theme of communion on that night as Jesus instituted the first communion. The theme then and still is is humility. Humility. Jesus had previously washed the disciples' feet as an example for them of how to serve others and how to humble themselves and not be arrogant. But to learn to serve with a, an attitude of humility. When the time came to give his life on the cross, he gave freely. He humbled himself there too. In fact, Scripture says in Philippians 2, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being 
when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. To be invited to this table, to be with Jesus at the table, humility was required. His disciples had had chosen to give their lives to follow Jesus. Those disciples were there that night, not as spectators, but as true participants in what Jesus was all about. They had given their lives to follow him. But there was one there that night He didn't stay. For good reason, he didn't stay. Because he would not humble himself. Judas left early. To come to this table and receive communion requires each of us to humble ourselves, to give ourselves freely to Jesus. You cannot come to this table and have communion with Jesus, a common union with Jesus, without first humbling yourself. We are not prideful here today. We come in humility. As those whose pride has been broken, because it has. You cannot come to this table without being broken. There is no other way to get here than through humble means of accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. As we take the bread this morning, for me, I understand that I have been given a free gift that I could receive no other way than freely. It is for me to humbly accept that I could not get this on my own, but it was freely given to me, not because I deserved it, but because of grace. So in humility, let us all remember again, we've been given this, not because we earned it, not because we were good enough, not because we were awesome enough, but because of what Jesus did for us. He gave his life, the bread of life, for me and for you. Eat in remembrance. As I take the cup this morning, I humbly understand that I've been given forgiveness not because I deserved it. It's something I couldn't earn. Something again given to me. Given also to you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ it was given to you as well. In humility I receive this as the free gift of forgiveness. Unearned forgiveness. Drink in remembrance.
Lord God, today we come to you and thank you again for all that you have done for us. Help us never to be arrogant. After all, you have done all this for us. We have done nothing for ourselves. We give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing?
short time ago in my reading through the book of Acts. I read the story that we're going to be talking about today. I commonly run across things and I think, you know, there's something about that. So I write it on my list. And uh, sometimes God brings me back around and shows me when I should when I should preach that message or do that Bible study or use whatever it is that that hit at the time. It's interesting how we can read something in the Bible and then and then that very thing plays out in life. That's what happened this week. And that's the reason I'm bringing you this message today. Here in Acts chapter 8, there's an interesting story of a man named Simon. Simon, pretty common name. Sort of like John, Simon. There were a lot of Simons. But this one was interesting. A different one. Here in Acts 8, verse 4. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds intensified intently intently to, uh, or listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years. Amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed. They believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result... Many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people in Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, They prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them, any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you said won't happen to me. After reading this, it makes you want to go, well, that's different. That's one of those different things. What do we do with this? That's what I was thinking as I read this. What do we do with this? The celebration over, over Simon's conversion must have, been a, 
it must have been a huge party in the church of new believers. Don't you imagine? I mean, here's this guy that he was known for being a sorcerer, a magician. And now, this. After all, when, when one who is known as the great power of God comes to a new understanding, that's reason to celebrate. Simon was used to being recognized. He was used to being popular, a popular larger-than-life figure. He had been a, a sorcerer, a magician for many, many years. And as you heard from the reading here, he claimed himself, as others did, as the great one, the power of God. But there was a new act in town. Simon was intrigued by, by what he saw in this Jesus movement. He recognized that what they did was far beyond his abilities, something he had never seen, never felt, or even experienced before. Because of what he saw, the scripture says, then Simon himself believed and was baptized. No doubt, no doubt Simon had some kind of religious experience and then went through the waters of baptism. You know, you know baptism is the, is, the, is the public confession of faith. It is, it is showing people outwardly what has happened in your heart. That's what baptism is about. But then something strange occurs. We see that the submission to Jesus that he confessed with his mouth and showed through his baptism was not evident in what happened next. After his baptism, he began following Philip wherever he went, the scripture says. And he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. It's almost sounding like a stalker here, huh? I mean, here's Simon, and he's following Philip everywhere he goes. Philip gets up in the morning, and here's Simon. Oh. He is stalking Philip. But why? He was amazed by the signs and great miracles that Philip performed. Notice, there is nothing spiritual behind this. It wasn't that he was following because he was moved by the Holy Spirit. He was amazed by what Philip could do. And he was closely watching to understand the mechanics of it. He wanted to know the trick. Because yeah, everything's a trick. He's a sorcerer, a magician. Everything's a trick. How was it done? That's what he wanted to know. Why? So that he could do it too. It wasn't the message that Simon craved. It wasn't the Christian fellowship around those Christians, those new believers. It was all about the signs and great miracles. He wanted that ability for his own magic show. But hearing this as his motive and then seeing the scripture that says Simon believed and was baptized, how do we merge these things together for understanding? 
I guess we need to ask a very important question. What does Simon believe? He believed and was baptized, it says. Isn't that the code words we're always looking for? I mean, when somebody says, Mike, I believe, I say, man, I'm glad to hear that. Because, you know, that's, I understand. That's a word that is a good word right there. I believe. And baptism. Man, when somebody goes through baptism, I'm thinking, here's an outward sign of an inward heart. Right? I'm thinking, whoo, yeah, belief and baptism, the two B words that I really like to hear. That's what we're looking for, right? Here's a guy who'd been exposed to the Christian faith. And felt something. He had a feeling and, and noticed it felt good. Sort of like the Bible story about the, the seeds being scattered. Remember that? Seeds are being scattered all over the place. And Simon is like the seed that fell on the path. Remember it was packed and hard. And the seed there did, it grew, but, but it grew. Well, it grew. It sprung up quickly. And then soon withered because it had no root, no depth. He had faith for the moment. But there was nothing lasting. There was no depth to his faith. Just a passing for the moment feeling. A feeling that was strong enough for him to act upon by being baptized with the others. The others who were professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Like many in our day, Simon had a, had a mental spiritual experience. You get that? A mental spiritual experience. Which means that he could say all the right words. I mean, he was able to use Christianese. You know, that language that have those certain words in it that we like to hear. If you don't know Christianese... You've been in church too long. Mm-hmm. Because we speak Christianese all the time. We just don't even recognize it anymore. He made, he made some, quick, some quick changes in his life to straighten up his act. He took the next step. He was baptized with the others. But for Simon, all these things were a change of mind. His heart never changed and he never received the Holy Spirit because he truly never submitted, gave in to Jesus. The ownership of his life still belonged to him and selfish pride still ruled in his heart just as it always had. But for the moment, To those around him, he looked like he had changed. Seeing what happened, it's, it was obvious he, he hadn't truly changed in his heart, inside. Because of what he did in offering money to Peter to buy the Holy Spirit. You understand? If you have to buy the Holy Spirit, it means you don't have the Holy Spirit. Seeing through the act, Peter gave him a double barrel rebuke. 
may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. How dare you think that this is something you can buy? How dare you think that you can get this in any other way? The evidence of a person who has not been truly changed. One who might be spiritual but not living in submission to Jesus is what we're seeing here. Simon was intrigued by by what he saw. He was drawn to this by the feeling of something real. Totally new and amazing. He was won over in his mind and agreed that what he had been feeling, well, nothing, nothing compared to this. But even seeing and feeling He still wasn't changed within. Peter goes on to say, you can have no part in this. For your heart, your heart is not right with God. Inside he was living the same old self-centered self, the same self-centered way. I'm in it for myself. That he had, the life he had lived all along. But outwardly, he, he buffed it up a bit, cleaned it up a bit, and to make it appear that he had changed. In truth, he had the same old attitude with a few outward modifications to fit in to the Christian crowd. You see, it's not just a few tweaks of an old life. The Bible says we are to have a total transformation so that the old life dies and the new life lives. Possibly thinking that Possibly thinking of this situation about Simon. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 14. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Don't backslide. You didn't know any better then But now, you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. The question this story stirs up, (laughs) there are many. Can a person believe that there is a God, believe that Jesus came and died for their sins, and while believing it as truth, never surrender to him as Lord? And the answer is yes. Can a person know all this, even agree that it is the truth, and yet never make it a personal decision to allow Jesus to be master of their life? And the answer is Yes. What are we to see in this? We are to see that first, faith in Jesus is more than a feeling. I know some of you are now singing a song. More than a feeling. Uh, I know. It's more than a feeling. It's more than loving thoughts about Jesus. Or, as I hear every once in a while, oh, you're the pastor at First Baptist Church? I remember I had some of the greatest times there. You see, 
It's more than warm feelings about a church. It's more than a feeling. Fans of Jesus have feelings. And those feelings come and go just as they do. But followers of Jesus have submission. And submission is consistent. It is a relationship with Jesus, not a feeling about Jesus. Faith in Jesus is more than a feeling. Number two, just because a person has been baptized doesn't mean that they are saved. Let me say that again. Just because a person has been baptized doesn't mean that they are saved. Did you know that? There is nothing miraculous about public baptism. It is an outward confession, but it doesn't mean it's true. Many, many, many have been baptized, but it doesn't mean they're saved. Baptism is a public outward expression of what has happened in the hearts. That's what it's supposed to be. Baptism is not magic. It is a public confession of faith. Number three. Just because someone says they believe doesn't mean that they will go to heaven. Remember, even Simon believed. And Peter explained that Simon had no part in this. See, belief without heart change is dead. You just can't fake phony belief for very long. When someone says they believe, there's got to be evidence of life change in the heart. But how many people do you know who explain where they are with Jesus by what they've experienced in the past? I've been baptized. I hear that one all the time. I've been baptized. Oh, I go to church faithfully every Christmas and Easter, even a few Sundays in between. I remember the feeling I had when I learned about Jesus as a child. I believe in Jesus. I used to faithfully go to church, but I sort of got out of the habit 20 years ago right after I got married. I can't tell you how many people I meet who used to be. Used to be. A lot of them used to be here. Used to be going to church here. And I say, where do you go to church now? And they give me that deer in the headlights look and thinking, And then it's usually, well, I, I don't go anywhere. I don't fellowship anywhere. You see, this is what surface belief looks like. It's all a mind thing. A mind thing. But being in relationship with Jesus is, is a heart thing. 
It is always based on submission. If you want to know if a person is in relationship with Jesus Christ, watch them, listen to them, don't believe what they say, believe what they do over time. You see, it's based on submission. It begins with an attitude change. I'm living under the, th- the authority of my, my master. What he says, I do. I will do it now because he says so. This attitude change is practiced. Constantly giving in. Constantly changing. Instead of being pridefully stubborn, there's an inner desire to give in and please Jesus. This is the new, constant push by the Holy Spirit and a continual submission in the Christian's life. And when we look at Simon, what we see is a little polish on the old person to make him look different. And for a while, he was faking people out. But the truth is, his attitude was all about, how can I get me some of this? How can I buy it if I can't do it any other way? How can I get this? I need a new trick for my show. You see, he hadn't changed at all. But he had a feeling. And that feeling, that feeling caused him to be even baptized. I wonder. I wonder if he just finally gave up and said, you know what, I can't compete with this. So I will become inside this to figure it out. To get where I want to be. Unchanged. It is the relationship with Jesus that Simon was missing. The relationship. The attitude change. Submission. You see, that's the way it always is for those who are fans of Jesus. They can talk as if they love Jesus. But the Lord said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Huh. If you love me, you will submit to my authority and keep my commandments. You see, you can say you love Jesus all you want. But submission, an attitude change, that's the relational difference. To follow him with all our heart is where he wants us to be. And that was Simon's problem. To follow Jesus with all your heart. Is that where you are today? What do you believe? You see, it's one thing to talk about Simon and all, but but what about you and what about me? What do I believe? What do you believe? Has my belief moved me to be submissive in a submissive relationship with Jesus Christ? Has your belief 
moved you to be in a submissive relationship with Jesus Christ? Is yours a heart thing or is it a head thing? I have great thoughts of Jesus, but it means absolutely nothing in my life. Or, I have great thoughts of Jesus, and he is my master, the king of my life, and I submit to his authority. I do what he says. He is my life. Which is it for you? As we close today, I want you to know that you can go from following Jesus in your head as a fan, or you can Change that to be a follower of Jesus in your heart as a submissive follower of Jesus. All it takes is a willingness to give in and to give yourself to the Lord fully to set your pride aside and to humbly come to Jesus. And say, I give you all of me. As we close today, we're going to sing a song as normal. I'll be up here singing along with you. I encourage you today to consider where you are with Jesus. You a fan or a follower? And if today is the day when you say, I want to go from being a fan to a follower, I encourage you to come. Let's talk right here. I want to help you with that. I want to help you make that step. Would you? If you need prayer about anything else, come. Come on up. Let's talk. I'll pray with you. Let's make sure that our relationship with the Lord is truly the relationship that ought to be and not just something in our head as Simon's was. Let's pray. Lord God, it is our pleasure to to remember again that you are life, that you provide life, that you've given us a new life if we have accepted you as our Savior and Lord. Help us to never go back, to never slide back into our old ways, but instead to continually confess to continually come to you and to continually say, yes, Lord, I hear that. I will do that right now. Help us to get beyond being like Simon and help us to be followers of Jesus who are obedient, who have had an attitude change, who are true followers of Jesus. As you guide us now, Lord, if there's a decision that needs to be made by anyone here today, I pray that you will push them into making that decision. Cause them to come so that we can talk. And Lord, may your will be done in our lives. 
Help us not just to talk about it, but to show it with everything we've got. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together. Come forward. I'll be right here. Let's talk. Come on. was years ago and my friend named Dan came to my office door and he said, he said, Mike, I, I need to make a confession. I've been going to this church for 20 years. And 
and I. I've been a phony. He had been going to the church for 20 years. He was on the deacon board of the church. He had never made that step to give his life to Jesus in a submissive way, to actually surrender himself. It was all a head thing for him. Nice guy. But when he came that day, he said, I, I need to be saved. I said, well, Dan, you were baptized, right? And he said, no, I've never been baptized. I said, how did you get on the deacon board without? And then I remembered. You see, sometimes we forget. It ain't a head thing, folks. It's not what you know. It's not how long you've been in the church. It doesn't matter. It's a heart thing. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is a living relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not on what was or what, what happened maybe years ago. It, it's what's today. Where are you today? Are you in relationship with Jesus or are you hanging on to something from back then? What a great day. When I was able to baptize Dan. Shortly after that, Dan died of cancer. Hmm. I'm sure glad he got it right. I'll see him one day. I hope to see you as well. Relationship is where it's at. What you know, where you've been, I don't care how long you've been in this church. Relationship with Jesus or nothing. Remember Simon. Take care, folks. <laughs>